So what I'd like to talk about today is a concept that I call infrastructure inversion. What I'm going to talk about is how things change when infrastructure that is new is laid on top of infrastructure that is old, and how that creates a conflict. Bitcoin is new. Bitcoin is different. And when I say the term Bitcoin, I'm speaking a bit more broadly. What I'm talking about is decentralized network-centric platforms of trust for doing currency and payments, and other applications of trust. It could be Bitcoin, it could be other things, but I'll just use the term Bitcoin to cover that whole category that has now been created. And it's new, and we're trying to somehow squeeze it on top of the existing banking system. <laughs> and the result is messy. Right? Not only is it messy, but it's also an opportunity for those who support the traditional banking system to go, hey, see? See? It's not working. <laughs> it's, it's slow. It doesn't work so well. Um, and this isn't new. This is a phenomenon that happens every time you have a new technology that is disruptive, that in the first few years of its adoption has to be carried by the existing technology that it is disrupting. So let's look historically at how these things play out. Now, when you read about it 20, 30, 40 years in the future, it's all very smooth. Right? Um, it's obvious because hindsight provides clarity. So, for example, automobiles, great invention. Um, and of course, when automobiles were invented, um, everyone in the world went, "Yay! We don't need horses anymore." Right? That's not exactly what happened. Instead, they said, "That's crazy." Uh, those noisy, disgusting machines that are probably going to kill us all will never work. <laughs> and why would anyone other than stupid rich people playing with these crazy, noisy toys want to use one of these horrible machines when we have perfectly good horses? That's actually what happens in history when you introduce a disruptive technology we meet resistance. Resistance is the first reaction. And the ones who succeed are the ones who continue, even though the rest of society tells them they are crazy to pursue this crazy idea. Automobiles, electrification, the internet, Bitcoin. Every time crazy pioneers who were made fun of by everybody else in society for their crazy ideas, persisted until everybody could see that what they were doing was correct. So, looking at that history, one of the really interesting things to me is the fact that in the beginning, the disruptive technology has to live in a world created for the technology it's replacing. So, when you first ride your brand new automobile in a city, you are riding on roads designed and used by horses, with infrastructure designed and used for horses. There are no light signals, there are no road rules, there are no paved roads. Right? You are in horse society, and you are the crazy one driving one of these vehicles. Well, there's a few things about horses that cars don't have. Right? These early cars were uh, forward wheel drive, right? so just two wheels turning. Right? Um, and horses are four foot drive vehicles, uh, which gives them a lot of flexibility. They also have balance. So if you have a road that is designed for horses, and it's not paved. The vast majority of roads were not paved. Some of them had cobblestones, but the vast majority were not paved. And they were also not dry. They were usually covered in mud and well, horse poo, um, because that's what horses do. And so this is the environment that the automobile had to prove itself in. It didn't start out with 
yes, great, we have now invented an automobile. Allow me to demonstrate on the Autobahn. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no. Um, instead, the crazy rich people who were experimenting with this technology were driving their cars in these roads with deep ruts where the horses had been, uh, in roads not designed for automobiles, in mud. And what happens? The cars got stuck, because they didn't have balance and four feet. So everybody went, <laughs> this is never going to work. Look, you can't even get out of the mud. <laughs> and also, where are you going to get gasoline? There's no gasoline stations. Right? There's, there's one gasoline station. What happens if you run out of gasoline before you get there? I mean, if your horse gets hungry, you can at least go a few more miles. But if your new crazy car idea runs out of gasoline, that's it. You're stuck. Uh, you were already stuck because of the mud. But now you're really stuck because you ran out of gasoline. <laughs> this is never going to work. So the infrastructure at first is the infrastructure of the technology you're replacing. And then of course, eventually, what happens is you build infrastructure for this new technology. And something really interesting happens, because when you pave roads and make them suitable for vehicles, the old technology, horses, are very comfortable on these new roads. Right? If you want to do a nice tour of Zurich on horseback, I'm sure, perfectly comfortable. Horses are very comfortable on asphalt, as are um, skateboards, segways motorcycles and bicycles, technologies that didn't exist. In fact, in order for those technologies to exist, you first had to put out the infrastructure for automobiles. Flat, paved roads not only allowed the automobile to exist, allowed the horse to comfortably exist, and opened the door for new technologies. And now you have people riding segways and scooters and skateboards and rollerblades and uh, prams and all of the other things that are moving around on our streets. Now That is an infrastructure inversion. You start with the new technology living on the old infrastructure. and Then it flips. You build infrastructure, and then the old technology rides on top of the infrastructure designed for the new technology. Let us look at a couple more examples like that. So, one of the great things about history is that some of the most confident sayings are often then ridiculed for centuries because they are so ridiculous. Like, for example, when electrification was introduced during the Paris Fair, and the mayor of Paris at the time said, electricity is a fad. And as soon as we close the Paris Fair and take down the Eiffel Tower, electricity will vanish in history. <laughs> Wrong on two counts. <laughs> Eiffel Tower is still standing, electrification won. But think about the time that electrification was happening. There was no infrastructure. And so how do you put electricity in a home? First of all, the only reason you would put electricity in the home is because you're one of these crazy rich people, probably some one of the same people who went and bought an automobile. And you are now putting um, basically the same thing that's in lightning in your walls, which is surely a crazy idea that will result in your house burning down. And that's what the newspapers wrote. Uh, they wrote about every house that burned down and how these crazy people were putting electricity in their homes. What was the infrastructure at the time? You had infrastructure for gas. In fact, gas lighting in major cities was pretty common. There were pipes that could deliver gas primarily to street lights, but also for home lights as well as heating. And you couldn't use that infrastructure for electricity. You couldn't use it to distribute electricity to homes. Um, so at first, the only use for electricity was really um, for factories, um, because that is where you could make the most use of electricity. In the past, in a factory, what you would have is you would have one motor in one corner of the factory, a very large motor, that then distributed motive power through a series of belts and pulleys throughout the uh, factory to run all of the other equipment. Right? And that was usually driven by gas, so it was basically a gas um, turbine. Electricity allowed you to distribute electricity 
um, directly to all of the devices and have electric motors, so factories with the obvious things. But why would you put it in your home? There was no infrastructure. And also, why would you use electricity since you already had light and you already had heating from gas, and it worked fine, right? And the infrastructure for gas wasn't useful for electricity. So if you wanted to do this, you would have to build new infrastructure. And then you get the other aspect of this infrastructure inversion, which is that those invested in the status quo point to your new electricity project, and they say, there's not enough distribution network to create customers, and there's not enough customers to require a distribution network. This is never going to happen, which is exactly what they said about cars. There's not enough gasoline stations to fill your car, and there's not enough customers to require a gasoline station. This will never happen. And then electrification starts happening. And people discover that once you put down electricity infrastructure, not only can you use that to do the new electricity capabilities, you can also use it to do the old applications. So you can do light and heating, and you can do them more effectively, in some cases, with electricity. But now you can do new things. You can do fans, and you can do air conditioning, and you can do motors, and you can do mixers, and you can do hair dryers. And generally speaking, houses don't burn down because of electricity too often. Right? So again, you get this infrastructure inversion. For the first few years, you have to run on the old infrastructure. It's almost impossible. You could theoretically attach a gas generator in your house, feed it with a gas, and generate electricity locally, but that wasn't very efficient. Then you build infrastructure for the new technology, and that infrastructure enables the old technology quite comfortably, lighting, heating, or horses, in the case of roads. Um, but it also opens the door for new applications that you couldn't do before, and the world changes. My third example is a bit more technical. And this is where you start seeing the audience separate into those who are over 35 and those who are under 35. Tell me if you can recognize this sound. <laughs> The people on under 35 are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> and the people over 35 are going, that's a modem! I used to have one of those. That's how we connected to the internet. So modem, and this is where we go into ancient history, is a modulator demodulator. It's a device that speaks data over a telephone line. And here's the thing, if you think about it, the telephone line is like a dirt road, and you're trying to drive a car over it. A telephone line is a, is a system designed to carry human voice. If you were my age, when telephone lines were still analog, and uh, I was a teenager at the time, and we still had pulse dialing uh, systems, we used to sometimes try to play music to our friends over the phone line. And if you've ever tried this, you will discover it doesn't really work. And the reason for that is because the frequencies that a telephone line allows are very, very narrow. Right? So what happens is the telephone network is designed to do one thing, and only one thing. It's highly specialized, just like the gas network that delivers gas to houses is only designed to deliver gas, not gas or water or electricity or oil, just gas. And it's specialized. The telephone system was designed to deliver just voice. And human voice is very specific. Our main frequency is one kilohertz, and then we go a bit below that and a bit above that. And there's a few people who can go quite a bit beyond that. And teenagers can go to frequencies that I can't even hear anymore. <laughs> but because the specialized use of voice, um, and because of the difficulties of transmitting voice, especially over great distances, engineers narrowed the range. If you allow the full range, you get voice, but you also get 
electrical interference at very high frequency. And you also get electrical interference from motors at very low frequencies. So what do you do if you have a phone line that's doing that? You put a filter that chops out the lows, and you put a filter that chops out the highs, and now it's cleaner. But now the voice starts sounding weirder and weirder, because it's being compressed. Now, this is a very difficult road to ride data over, right? because when you are transmitting data, you want to get a lot of information in a very narrow frequency band. So This whistling sound that you hear with the modem is basically two modems trying to test, on this specific connection, how much room do we have. Right? And basically, what the modem is doing is it's going, hello, 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 hello. Hello. And the other modem is going, I heard the first three, <laughs> the last one didn't come through. <laughs> right? And then the opposite, going low frequency, hello, 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 hello. I heard the first three, but the last one didn't come through. Okay, great. So now we know we have six bands of frequency to work with. Now I'm going to start changing between those bands very quickly. Let's see how much of this you can understand. <laughs> and that's changing frequencies very quickly between two bands. And then the other modem goes, I heard all of that, great. And now we can transmit data. This is an insane way to do data transmission. <laughs> You've basically got two devices that are singing to each other over a very narrow channel, trying to somehow squeeze through this little straw as much data as possible. And then we upgraded them, and they got better and better at doing this. And the phone companies hated it. Like, that's not what we designed the network for. <laughs> this is a pristine, state-of-the-art voice communication network. What the hell are you people doing? In fact, in, in the country where I grew up, in Athens, if you tried to make a long-distance call with a modem, what you would hear is... Click. <laughs> what? What just happened? Oh, they cut off lines if they detect a modem, because we're competing against the phone company. Kind of like banks shutting down accounts of Bitcoin companies, right? Or basically exactly the same. And what did they say at the time? They said we could deploy data connections, fiber, coaxial cables, direct data connections at high bandwidth. But first of all, no one needs high bandwidth. Because what are they going to do? Transmit voice? We already have a voice network. It's fantastic. We don't need these new things. And secondly, you don't have enough users to deploy coax, and you don't have enough coax to build a user base. This is never going to happen. Right? The same exact idea. And then we had one of the most spectacular examples of infrastructure inversion in my, I've ever seen, and that I recall from history. When First, the internet was not wanted and carried over phone lines reluctantly. Then, the internet was carried over phone lines by phone companies becoming internet service providers. Then, gradually, their backbones become data-oriented. Then, their entire network becomes digital. Then, their entire network starts running over the internet. Then, they start running all of their phone lines on top of the internet. So today. Every single phone call you do anywhere in the world is carried over the internet, with a few exceptions at the edges in some developing countries. A complete infrastructure inversion. Turns out, it's very difficult to push data through a narrow phone line designed for voice. But if you flip the equation, putting voice over a data connection is trivially easy. What's the difference? One is extremely specialized. It has already chosen the application for you. The application is voice. Data is the exception that you're trying to squeeze through. The other one is very generic. Data means anything. And voice is just one of the applications carry it comfortably. I think the ultimate irony of the phone companies was a special thing called comfort noise generation. If you're a phone engineer, you know what I'm talking about. This is the most ironic thing ever. So after years and years of people my age being used to their phone lines sounding like all the time, right? 
When we started having cellular telephony and digital phone lines that were perfect, they had no noise. So the moment the other person stopped talking, what you would have was complete silence. And so you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess they hang up. They didn't hang up. They're still there. There's just none of the. <sighs> so then the phone companies invent the most brilliant technology ever, which is comfort noise generation, which is a device that sits on your end of the phone and it looks to see if the connection is still open. And if it is, it whispers in your ear. <sighs> just to make you feel comfortable that the other person is still there. It actually generates high-frequency noise on purpose, artificially on your end, noise that isn't on the system, <laughs> just so that you don't think the other person has hung up. Right? And the very same companies that said, we will never be able to do quality voice over the internet, and we don't want the internet on our phone lines, are now injecting noise in order to simulate the terrible performance of the previous network, because now we're delivering CD quality or better sound across continents. Complete infrastructure inversion. And then we get to Bitcoin. And now we have a decentralized trust platform that can do settlement of transactions on a global basis without intermediaries. But in order to get into the system or get out of the system, because we still have to live in the old system, we have to go through exchanges, we have to go through bank accounts, we have to do IBAN transfers, we have to use credit cards. Right? And so what we're doing is we're riding the automobile on the muddy roads of banking. Right? The Bitcoin supercar for the Formula One of finance. Right? is riding along on the muddy roads of 1970s mainframe-based banking. And it's a bumpy road. And, and the banks point to this and go, <laughs> it's not working. Look, you have to do all of the regulation that we have to do. You have to do all of the identity that we have to do. You have to slow everything down to the speed of traditional banking. This is never going to work. Not only that, but... You don't have enough users to build infrastructure, and you don't have enough infrastructure to attract new users. So this is clearly never going to work. But what we do have, just like with electricity and the automobile and the internet, is we have a new technology that has within it the promise of a thousand other applications they haven't even imagined. And this is my prediction. We're going to see over the next 15 to 20 years a great infrastructure inversion that will happen in finance. And what will happen is the banks will resist, then the banks will adopt, then the banks will run their systems alongside blockchain and Bitcoin systems. And finally, they will run all of traditional banking as an application on top of a decentralized trusted ledger. Because while it is very hard to do a decentralized trusted ledger that is connected to all of these legacy banking systems, simulating legacy banking on top of a decentralized ledger, on top of Bitcoin, an open global blockchain, is trivial. All you have to do is take all of its capabilities and slow them down. <laughs> I can create an application that takes your Bitcoin transaction and makes it clear in three to five business days for a cost of five dollars. <laughs> and I've implemented traditional banking. It's kind of like the comfort noise generation. For those of us who are so accustomed to banking of a previous generation who are like, I don't like all of this fast finance. It makes me uncomfortable. I want to sit at my kitchen table every Sunday and balance my checkbook, right? And make sure none of my checks balances, right? I don't like all of this electronic instantaneous global transfer. It scares me. Who knows? So we can slow it down. What we're going to see is this infrastructure inversion will allow us not only to comfortably run the traditional banking applications on top of a distributed global ledger, an open blockchain like Bitcoin's, the open blockchain, probably Bitcoin's open blockchain. 
But then we open the door for other applications, for applications we've never seen before. And these will appear to traditional banking like a segue or a skateboard appears to someone who is absolutely determined to continue the tradition of horse carriage riding in the city of Zurich. And these applications will look the same as someone who is still trying to do gas lighting in their traditional Victorian house. And these applications will look as alien as someone who is still trying to do comfort noise in a CD or better quality voice communication over the internet that is capable of so much more. Enabling the future on your legacy system is very difficult. And while you're trying to do that, everyone's pointing at the future and going, ha, look, it doesn't work. Until you flip the infrastructure and then simulating the past on the network of the future becomes extremely easy. So what we're part of now is the very early stages as we look at the future of money and the first stages of the greatest infrastructure inversion the world has ever seen. Thank you. So what we're going to do um, for the next part of uh, tonight is um, I'll be happy to take some questions, which will probably go for you know two to three hours. Um, then after that, um, if you happen to have brought a book, I would be delighted to sign it for you. But we have three books here that we're going to give out with a drawing, a random selection. And um, finally, after all of that, we'll shut it down, and I'll be happy to talk to you all preferably in the area that serves beer, um, and we can continue this on a social level. So, Lucas, do you want to do Q&A first, or drawing for the books? No, Q&A. All right, who has a question? Let's get a microphone to you. I am very easygoing. Don't be shy. Please ask me questions. Yes. <laughs> so basically, Bitcoin is like a guillotine. So you mention it, and it goes down on your head, and it cuts it off. It's uh, what? It's like a guillotine. Every time you mention yes. Bitcoin, basically the other party you're trying to sell the technology to shuts off. Yes. We, we experienced that when we delivered blockchain technology with the Red Cross together to Lebanon. When we mentioned the word Bitcoin, the counterparties we dealt with usually had a big issue of listening to the advantages of the technology. Right. And so how do, we, how do we go around that? What's your take on that? Well, I mean, the reason is because there has been a very strong campaign to ensure that Bitcoin is associated with negative things. And this is not a coincidence. This is exactly the response you see to any disruptive technology. So you have two things. First of all, you have a technology that is different enough, that is difficult to understand. And then you have that technology offending some of the well-entrenched issues. Um, I can guarantee you that the Stable and Horse Carriage Association of Switzerland was none too happy about this new automobile idea. And I'm sure they talked to a lot of journalists about how these devices would kill people on the street. Um, and made too much noise and broke down and were unreliable. Now, if you think that's a joke, you should go look out the um, Red Flag Act that was passed in the United Kingdom in 1896 that required every uh, automobile greater than a certain length to have an operator, an engineer, and a conductor. And they had to have a flag person running ahead of the automobile, waving a red flag to warn all of the innocent, terrified pedestrians that an infernal death machine was barreling down the road, trying to kill them. This law passed in England, and it slowed down the development of automobiles fatally for England. These things happen again and again and again and again. The initial response you get is part fear of change, part engineered fear um, because of interests. 
And, and Bitcoin, just like the internet, look at all of the articles that were written in 1992, 93, 94 about the internet. The internet is a den of thieves and pedophiles and criminals and terrorists. And if you let your children get onto the internet, they will surely be destroyed. And no one uses it except for criminals and weird scientists. But we already knew they were weird anyway. Um, and it has no practical use because we have fax machines and post offices that work perfectly fine. Thank you very much. And in any case, the phone companies are building a much better version, which is the internet only without any of the open, borderless, content-creating innovation and freedom that the internet is. Just closed, curated, editorially controlled, safe, PG-13, appropriate for all audiences, and boring. And in the end, those things failed. And they failed because what was exciting about the internet was that it was open and decentralized and borderless. And in the end, yes, criminals used the internet. Of course they did, just like they used automobiles, and electricity, and phones, and shoes to run away from robberies. And the bottom line is, you don't make transportation policy, or shoe policy, or telephone policy, or internet policy, or financial policy, based on the narrow use a criminal will apply to a technology. You look at the bigger picture as to what happens if you give the tools of financial freedom to seven and a half billion people. Now that's terrifying to some. I don't care. I'm not going to try to sell this because this. Bitcoin is useful because it solves real problems for real people. So if you want to just wrap it up in a nice little blockchain shell and put a bow around it and say, "Don't worry, this is just like Bitcoin, only safer, and you know, not going to be used by criminals." Of course, it's going to be used by criminals. You know why? Because criminals run the banks. <laughs> because criminals run governments. They are some of the biggest criminals out there, and eventually they are going to be using Bitcoin technology. too. So I am not worried about trying to market this. What I am worried about is how do we make it useful to as many people as possible. And the rest is it will simply be washed away in history. And one day our children will hear this completely fabricated story. And the fabricated story will be, and Satoshi Nakamoto invented blockchain, and the world rejoiced. And was never the same again. Just like we do the story, if you go into an American school and you ask them, how was the automobile invented, or who invented electricity? Edison came with the idea, tried it once, everybody hailed him as a hero. It was a stunning success, and the world moved on. Ford created automobiles for everyone. Everyone was happy. Of course, neither of those people actually created the thing, and they were ridiculed for decades. <laughs> Some of the inventors of these technologies died poor and ridiculed and destroyed, we rewrite the history later. So I'm not worried about perception. That's a very long answer to your question, but there you go. Thank you. By the All way, right. great book, great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hello. Who's I'm got here? A... Oh, over the... oh, we have two microphones. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thanks for all these analogies. That was very interesting. Thank you. I just didn't get one point. Is what is um, the infrastructure which will be needed for Bitcoin to become mainstream? Right. Well, you know, part of the infrastructure. The good news is we don't have to do all of the heavy lifting of building new roads and building new internet because we already have the internet. So that's one big difference in this infrastructure inversion. The infrastructure we're building or need to build within Bitcoin is access to financial capabilities and the liquidity to make those viable. That means having enough people who have access to wallets and wallets uh, that are decentralized and easy to use and easy to secure and easy to understand and education for developers who are writing these applications and education for users and um, all of the things that need to smooth adoption. Now, right now, Bitcoin is difficult to use, it's difficult to secure. It's still the very early stages, and that's fine. Um, as we educate more developers in more languages across the world, and they build better applications suited to the local languages, and more people get involved and start using Bitcoin as a means of exchange, you build liquidity. Liquidity allows more applications. Density of adoption allows more applications. Um, the network effect kicks in, and uh, as each 
new person is added to a network, the usefulness of the network increases exponentially. Because for the new person, connecting to everybody else is useful. But for everybody else, the fact that they now can connect to a new person is also useful. And that's the exponential effect of Metcalfe's laws. It's called the network effect. That's what's required here. We're not going to need to build physical infrastructure. We're going to need to build better and easier ways of getting on, so that more people get on, so that we have social infrastructure, economic infrastructure. This is an economic tool, and therefore having a robust econ economy with economic activity is the infrastructure for Bitcoin. You will know when we have it. It's a very simple, very simple test. The day when you ask someone, how much is one Bitcoin? And they say, oh, it's, it's, I don't, it's, what do you mean? It's one Bitcoin. One Bitcoin is a thousand millibits, uh, 100 million Satoshis, or one Bitcoin. No, no, but how much is it in dollars? Oh, well, well I mean, a dollar is zero point something Bitcoin, but who cares? <laughs> That's when you know we've made the economic inversion, the infrastructure inversion. Yes, um, do we have a microphone? Okay, and if the next person wants to raise their hand so we can get a microphone for you in advance, very good. Go ahead. Uh, so the key fulcrum to blockchain technology is decentralized uh, ledger and decentralized consensus. And you talk about a future where this could be the economic standard, so to say, across the world. And you mentioned seven and a half billion people. My question really is: those people are not evenly distributed, right? So no, hypothetically. Not. There could be a, a, a country which could dominate in terms of mining power, and then um, it's not so neutral anymore as a platform, right? So, is there any way you have any thoughts around that? How we can overcome it? Because this would be one of the questions that governments across the world would ask when yes. trying to adopt this. Well, well, d domination by a single country um, is extremely unlikely because the the bottom line is, I mean. You will see in the early stages, especially because of certain convergence of characteristics, like for example, the availab availability of cheap and uh, immediate geographic access to silicon fabrication is an advantage today, and it's an advantage because we're moving from generation to generation of ASIC every three months. That era is over. We hit 16 nanometers. We're not changing ASIC generations now for two years. That's going to change the environment of mining dramatically. I'm not that worried about centralization in any single country. Um, you know, countries would be worried about that. Well, you know, if you think about it, uh, today our currencies are run by a proof of oil consensus algorithm, right? And there is a certain amount of concentration of the underlying proof of oil resource in some countries, which some, admittedly may have said leads to war. Um, so th that doesn't change. Digital cryptocurrencies, decentralized currencies, they still have people in them, and these people still will engage in geopolitical games. That doesn't change, but the, how decentralized things are changes the equation. It makes it less likely that you're going to have such um, specific concentrations that are based on a resource that really can't move because it's been there for millions of years. Um, so I think we're going to see a very different environment evolve. I don't know what that environment will be yet. So th this is part of being part of history. You get to see it as it unfolds. Who's got the next question? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I just, if I may, would like to go back to the um, to the original question. You talked about the status quo, fighting the new um, technology, and this whole idea of co-opting. And the banks being against Bitcoin. If you look back over, the, I don't know, let's say the last six to nine months, it seems like banks are going bananas for the blockchain. Yes. Um, there's, oh, they're opening up laboratories. They're coming with this, and Blythe Masses is running around, and all of this other stuff. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about if you're not, if you're really sure that the banks won't succeed in co-opting this technology, bolting the old system on top, and then we all keep going like we are, or is it really going to open up to everyone? That's a really good question. And if they could co-opt this technology, they certainly would. Um, but that, the problem is understanding exactly what's at stake here and what the differentiation is. The, the thing that makes Bitcoin interesting 
is not the fact that you can use it to record transactions in a chain of blocks. That is not interesting. That is, in fact, stunningly boring from a database science perspective. Um, what is interesting is being able to remove central uh, control of third parties by decentralizing the security mechanism through a proof-of-work consensus algorithm. What that gives you is a set of capabilities. Immutability, unforgeability, open access, permissionless innovation, borderless systems, and censorship resistance. And none of these are in any way remotely interesting to banks, and they don't want any of them. So what they're trying to do is say, we see what you have there. We would like the same, only without the open, borderless, permissionless innovation, decentralized control, open access, and censorship resistance. Could we have one of those? And that's exactly like saying, I like this internet thing you have there. I think the underlying technology is packet switching. And packet switching is fantastic. Forget the net neutrality, open, borderless publishing, and freedom of expression. Blah blah blah. <laughs> you know. That's irrelevant. What we really want to do is use packet switching to transmit corporate-produced content directly into the TVs of every household in a centralized, top-down, hierarchical way, where we control the content and don't worry, it will all be suitable for your children, produced by Disney and controlled forever by us. They failed to do that because that's not what people wanted. Because what they saw in the internet was the possibility of taking control of the means of producing content and becoming consumers and producers of content, of equalizing things. And the ability to directly connect with people around the world was exciting. That's what blockchain doesn't have the way they call it. Right? So the thing you have to ask yourself is, what are the 7.5 billion people on this planet looking for in terms of economic inclusion? Are they looking for something that has identity and KYC, and controls on the borders, and regulations about the amounts, and totalitarian surveillance, and a very cozy relationship between regulators and state and money? Or are they looking for a new way? And the answer is simple. Most of them are not part of that system, because they haven't been invited. And they'll never be invited, because right now what we're doing is restricting the number of people who can actually access that system. Economic inclusion is backtracking. So what Bitcoin offers is not what the banks are co-opting. What they're co-opting is a system that has nothing to do with what we're building. This is a comparison between centralization and decentralization, and they can't co-opt decentralization. Because by co-opting decentralization, they lose all the power. So some banks will. Some banks will adopt decentralization as their go-forward mantra, and big chunks of the industry will be replaced by companies you've never heard of before. Which is why the top companies on the internet are not the phone companies, for the same exact reason. I'm not worried about banks co-opting blockchains. They have bigger problems. They've got to figure out what the hell to do with interest rates. <laughs> Oops. Uh, who's got the microphone? Yes, go ahead, Thanks. and then the next person there. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a complete Bitcoin newbie, so I apologize if my question sounds no silly. No problem, but please. What like. are the, uh, the most outlandish uh, Bitcoin applications you've seen? Tonight you're talking about reinventing the payment gateways and financial infrastructures, but you mentioned that once this inversion has taken place, this opens up new doors to new applications. So, mm. some examples. Um, it's very, very difficult to see those. Um, because they, they depend on a number of different things. First, you need the infrastructure, but then you also need widespread adoption. So, if you look back at the internet and you look at 1992 and you say what we're going to see in the future, right? I mean, video teleconferencing was obvious. That was part of Star Trek 20 years earlier. They could imagine that. What they couldn't imagine was Wikipedia or Google search or social media. And the reason they couldn't imagine that is because a lot of those things actually require a density of adoption to even be possible. Right? You can't do social media unless almost everyone you know is able to use it, which means they already have internet, preferably mobile internet. You can't do Wikipedia unless there's enough people who can go in there and continuously improve the product. You can't do Google search until there's enough pages that you can do cross-correlation of deep linking. 
So all of these applications only emerge once you set down certain prerequisites, and those prerequisites and the applications that come out of them are invisible in the beginning. This happens with every type of new disruptive technology, which is that over the first decade or decades of their development, most of what you see is skeuomorphic design, meaning that it is design that mimics the shadow of the past. So you go in places like um, New York, and you introduce steel into construction. And what do they use steel to do at first? They use it to build a brick building that looks exactly like all the other brick buildings, only is a bit taller. Right? They don't say, you know, maybe instead of windows this large, we can make the entire facade of the building glass. That doesn't even cross their mind. They spend the next two decades repeating the forms. In fact, one of the most ironic things is that you start seeing with modern construction techniques, um, people put up houses and then they put Roman columns in front. And Roman columns have a very specific purpose. They're there to hold the roof up. They're not decorative elements. <laughs> but you don't need them to hold the roof up anymore because you have steel beams or bricks or other techniques. So the columns are now purely decorative. They serve no practical purpose. You're just giving kind of a little hat tip to the past. For the, for the first decade in Bitcoin, the vast majority of what you're going to see and the least interesting things are going to be, well, here's what we did with banking. Let's take it a bit further. So we're thinking about, ah, let's, you know, retail commerce plus Bitcoin. Bitcoin retail commerce, checking and savings. Let's call destination addresses checking accounts. Bitcoin checking and savings, right? Um, and so this is not innovative. It's skeuomorphic, and we're going to see that happen for decades, uh, possibly. But what's going to start appearing once you lay down the ground to have enough people to do adoption is then you have interesting opportunities. The, the most interesting opportunities for me come from some of the narrow areas where Bitcoin can do things that are not possible today because of its different nature. Here's one that will. I'll just throw a few out there. Okay, so um, every single financial system we have assumes personhood. The the uh, entity that owns and controls money is either a person or an association of people through a corporation. That is it. You cannot have person. You cannot have money without personhood. Because the legal jurisdiction that supports it requires personhood. Well, elliptic curve digital signatures don't give a damn about personhood, and that is the legal infrastructure on Bitcoin. So you can have ownership and control of money through the ownership and control of elliptic curve digital signatures without a person. That means that software agents and machines can directly own and control money without any human being involved at all. You could create um, an autonomous system of charity that trolls the web, looks for hurricanes, and then if it finds enough, it starts a fundraiser, takes the money, and then distributes it equally to um, charitable organizations or directly to the people who, through the GPS on their phone, show that they are in the middle of the disaster, and has no board of directors, no owners, no um, corporate structure whatsoever. It's simply an automatic money-controlling system. The most wild idea I had is what happens if you take self-driving cars, Uber and Bitcoin, mash them together, and you have the world's first self-owning taxi. Um, a taxi that effectively owns itself. It has paid for its own lease, it's paid for its own maintenance, its own insurance. It collects money from passengers that ride in it, that it provides rides for. And then pays for gas automatically using Bitcoin and pays for its annual maintenance. Now, if you think that could never happen, I've even constructed a scenario of exactly how it would happen. It wouldn't start with autonomy. It would start with an elderly taxi driver who gradually turns themselves into an entrepreneur and owns a fleet of taxis, and then replaces their drivers with autonomous vehicles, and then automates their accounting so that they have to do less and less and less work, and then they die without heirs, and nobody notices. Because the next morning, <laughs> the taxis go out, and they continue doing what they've already been doing, and then you have the first emancipated taxi uh, that suddenly became its own autonomous entity. This is not completely outlandish. Um, there are plenty of examples 
of, um, for example, they found an elderly person in Japan who had died in their apartment 17 years before they found the body, because they had a pension coming in and direct debit of their electricity and utilities, and the air conditioning was turned up enough, and they died in their apartment without airs. Nobody noticed. For 17 years, they just sat there, and the apartment kept being rented, and the rent kept getting paid, and the electricity got paid. And essentially, the apartment emancipated itself. <laughs> but you could do this with a self-driving taxi. There are some really weird things that happen when you remove personhood from the ownership of money. And that's just one example. The other really interesting area is the possibility of doing nano-payments. Nano-payments both in terms of value and in terms of time granularity. With, with certain constructs within Bitcoin called payment channels, or lightning network, and things like that, you can do payments for services that are billed for a thousandth of a cent in increments of 200 milliseconds or less. So what could you possibly do with that? I have no idea. I'm sure there are some very smart developers trying to think of something cool now. So again, you lay this infrastructure, everybody has enough liquidity, people have easy access to it, and then you start laying on top applications that were absolutely impossible to do before. And, and that's when we really have an interesting world. So, yeah, that's going to happen over the next 20 years. Okay, let's take uh, maybe two more questions. Yes. Hello. Hey. Um, you mentioned earlier, so um, assuming a widespread adoption of Bitcoin, do you believe that we're going to see uh, similar, like today, different currencies in different regions of the world? Or do you believe that there will be just one Bitcoin, assuming this takes over? Um, do you speak English? Do you speak German also? Yeah. Did you abandon German once you learned English? No. No. But, but no, no, sorry, English I, sorry, is... Sorry, I think is, I was unclear. Do you assume there will be more than one Bitcoin? Yes, well, again, the, to that question, is the, the point is that... You didn't abandon German when you started learning English, and the reason you didn't abandon it is because while English has its uses and may in, in, in some places in the world be the dominant language, that doesn't mean that it exists in exclusion of the other languages. And in fact, you have the ability to use multiple languages. And what you do is you use languages that are appropriate for the context in which you are, and that gives you cultural significance and use within the niche, right? Um, and so when you think of money as something that is owned by the state and associated with a, f with a flag, like for example, Swiss Air. Right? Remember when all of the airlines had flags on them? And each country only had one airline, and it was the only one that was allowed to land in the main airport? Yes, okay, I'm over 40. <laughs> but I remember it, and that was an absurd idea. Right? So the, when you only had one phone company, it was the national phone company. And it was the only one allowed to install residential telephone lines within the homes of people resident in that country, and the only one allowed to do long-distance calls. That thinking for currency still exists today, and it is an absurd idea, and it creates absurd consequences. The idea that for one currency to succeed, the others have to lose, or that there can be within a jurisdiction only one currency, and if you had a currency of every jurisdiction, then eventually it would become the only currency. If you think of instead of currency as a form of language, as a linguistic construct for expressing value, there are languages that work in certain contexts. Right? How many of you speak Greek? You're wrong. All of you speak Greek. Have you ever heard of a gastroenterologist? an ophthalmologist, an orthopedic. Right? You speak Greek, because medicine is the context in which we all speak Greek. A bit of Greek. And so we speak Greek. We also all speak Latin. Right? And in some domains, we all speak English, because of computers. And in some domains, we speak German. And in some domains, we speak Spanish. The point I'm trying to make is that if you think of money as a language, then the language you use depends on the context in which you're using it and what the other person speaks. And so the money you use 
will depend on the context in which you are using it and what money the other person accepts. With digital currencies, it is no longer a system where there have to be a certain number of winners, and everybody else has to disappear, or where the competition is like that. There are no monopolies. So, how many currencies will we have? In the old days, we used to say, how many newspapers does a city have? And you could answer with a simple number, and say two or three. And then at some point, blogging happened. Now, how do you think the question, how many bloggers can there be? And can one blogger dominate all of the blogging within a country or a topic or a language? You see, it becomes an absurd question because everyone can be a blogger, and every one of us can be a bank, and every one of us can have a currency, and therefore the concept of how many will there be? Well, all of them, right? thousands, hundreds of thousands. How many of them will be important? Tens, hundreds. And will they displace one another? Or will one be the universal currency? There will be no universal currency, for the same reason there is no universal language, because there is no universal culture, and there is no universal context, and there is no universal set of needs. So this is a really good question that you're asking because this is a question that comes up a lot, again and again and again. And it reflects this new way that we have to start thinking about currency, which is completely separate from the way we thought before. Ironically, the idea of national currencies associated with a flag, not only will that end up being something that doesn't exist in the future, uh, but in the end, it will be something that only existed for a very short period of time in history. It is a relatively new invention, <laughs> and it will go away uh, pretty soon. Um, in the United States, for example, Ben Franklin, one of the founders of the country, his job was a commercial printer. His number one product was private currencies. He printed private currencies, because in those days, the idea of one currency across an entire federated nation was nonsense. Turns out they were right. It's nonsense. If you turn a whole economic area into one currency, oh boy, that could go wrong, said the Greek. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take one more. Who's got here? Uh, thanks for coming to Zurich. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, if you could uh, select one challenge in the Bitcoin world and uh, wish for it to be solved today, which one would that be and why? You're, you're going to be surprised by my answer, probably. Um, user experience design is the challenge that I wish could be solved today. I wish we had a lot more user experience and user interface designers in this space. Um, at the moment, we have many incredibly talented engineers who are terrible at design. And, um, they make systems that are uh, completely impossible to understand. The primary role of a user experience design, as I speak not as a designer, but from my understanding, is to create metaphors that allow you to associate the new thing with something that you already have a mental framework for, and create expectations in your mind as to how this thing is going to behave, and smooth the process of using it by having the thing behave the way you expect it to behave because of the metaphors that have been created. So, having said all that, you have a currency that is the most abstract currency that we have ever designed. What should we call it? Bitcoin. Because coin is the word that describes the least abstract currency ever designed. <laughs> the most physical form of currency. And coins behave in a very specific way. You hold them in your hand, just like, oh, that didn't create the right expectation. Let's put the word bit in front, because in half the languages it means small, and the other half of the languages it means I'm a geek. <laughs> that will alienate everybody else, right? Then let's take the thing that holds all the keys that control the Bitcoin. I'm going to call it Trustnet, because that's what it should have been called. Um, let's take all of the keys that control it. And let's call that no keychain would be too obvious. How about wallet? Because of course you can copy a, oh no, you can't copy a wallet, but you can copy a keychain. 
If we called it keychain, it would actually make sense, because if you give someone a copy of the key to your house, they can get into your house. So if you copy a keychain, they have access to everything you have. Or you can make a backup and give it to your neighbor if you trust them. Well, that makes far too much sense. Let's call it a wallet, because that's where you store the actual coins, which don't exist in Bitcoin. And the wallet is the place we don't actually store the coins. You see, this is the problem. So if I had like a magic wand and I could go back to 2009, I would find Satoshi Nakamoto, and I, and I would go expel the engineers and design us, and boom, he would become a user experience designer, and we'd have better names for everything. Um, the biggest challenge we have for adoption is that normal people cannot understand this stuff. And they shouldn't need to. Right? You don't expect normal people to understand it. In, um, in the early 90s, I remember it was around 1995, there was a TV show uh, called Good Morning America. And you've got five journalists sitting around on a couch. And they've got this on YouTube, if you want to watch it. And it's the pre-take before the show, and they're about to talk about the internet. Um, so they're getting prepared for the conversation, and one of the journalists is saying, "So which one is the internet? Is that is that the ad sign? No, 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 no. That's email. Oh, so it's the dot. No, 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 no. The dot. That's both email and the internet. It's the www. But what about the slash slash colon thing? No, it's not slash slash colon. It's colon slash slash." Right? And you can see how incredibly confused they are. Right? <laughs> That's where we are in Bitcoin terms. And two things happened since then. One, we, we made things easier. And two, a whole generation of people grew up who learned this as a language from childhood, and to them it's no longer weird. Um, both of those things need to happen in Bitcoin. Our biggest challenge is not the block size limit, or um, the adoption of new tech technologies, or whether the banks will let us or not. We didn't ask for their permission, or whether governments will regulate this, um, or how fast the technology is going. It's going great. Um, our biggest challenge is how do you make this easier to use and easier to secure for people who are not me, for my mom. And when we solve that problem then we see some really big success. So I'll leave that as the last question. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>